Jack. Uh, Bill, why don't you just tell a little bit about your, your background, what you did at, uh, at HP Compact. So at uh, Compact, between myself and uh, one of the other co-founders, we designed every generation of RAID controller that, that Compact ever built. Uh, we, we designed the ASICs that went in the smarter, that became the smart array for all of HP servers. And then uh, we left in 98 and we actually designed the next two generations of RAID controllers and licensed that back to Compact and then HP after we left. Um, after that played out, we decided to uh, do something a little bigger, and that's when we did Pivot 3. So Pivot 3 was founded in 2003, and um, its first market that we went after was uh, surveillance. And we have, we have purpose-built appliances that are tuned for a given uh, application segment or a given value proposition. And of course, we're, we're not here to go into great depth in terms of what we're doing in the surveillance market, but suffice it to say that we've got actually nearly 600 customers that are using our unified storage and compute appliances, which represents about it, north of 33,000, 3,500 appliances. So we've been shipping converged infrastructure for well over three years, so, and, and, and in the thousands. So, and what's interesting about the surveillance marketplace and how it's applicable here is that the surveillance marketplace guys had uh, essentially very low skills in terms of IT. We're talking guns and badges guys who are running petabytes of storage, no sand administration expertise and a lot of ROI cost pressures, and which made it a nice fit for what we are looking at in terms of the segment that we're, we're addressing in BDI. All right, um, we're headquartered in Austin, Texas. Yes, we all flew in from Texas. Um, <laughs> yes, and our arms are tired. Yeah, okay, got it. All right, uh, these are um, some of the customer segments that we're in today, healthcare, education, airports, retail, gaming. Yeah, we do a lot of, a lot of the casinos uh, uh, around, the, around the world are using our, our surveillance products, retail, um, railways, law enforcement, as you can imagine. So lots and lots and lots of petabytes of storage out there being managed by, by Pivot3 Unified Storage and Compute Appliances. That was it for the introduction. We're going to go straight into, fair enough, just gives you a little bit of a background of who we are. Um, one more slide that I'll do, and then I'll get Bill into uh, his architecture slides. VStack OS, we've got two, essentially, we, we build VStacks. There's kind of like, think of, if you think Mac, think Apple, there's a VStack for that. Think about a, a tuned appliance for a given application segment. So there's a VStack for that. In this case here, what we're going to be talking about today is VStack VDI. Our Pivot3 VStack OS uh, software system seamlessly creates and unifies server virtualization with scale-out, load balance, highly available block storage, which we'll get into in great depth. Runs on Commodity 86 hardware. That looks like a Dell server. It is a Dell server. <laughs> okay. Thank you for it is. saying that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, I didn't notice. Yeah, that's right. That's a, that's a 510 in case anybody's uh, wondering, right? Um, so when we, ship, when we ship an appliance, and if we, when we package it together with something like, for example, Vue Premier, we are actually shipping a, a bundled solution for Vue. And that's kind of what we call a VStack application. Fair enough? Bill, I'm going to lead you through this since you're standing. Okay. So let me just first try to explain how we distribute the data. Um, it'll help under, make you understand some of the other conversations as we go into it. Um, we take multiple boxes and we're spreading the data out over all the boxes. I mean, every volume you create, the data is spread out over all of the drives and all of the boxes. So as the data, go ahead and hit next, as the data first starts to come in, um, it winds up on at least one drive, on a drive in each box, and then the parity winds up in a drive on a different box from that data. As more data comes in, it hits other drives, and then the parity for that data, make sure you hit another drive, and so on. So then what happens when a box fails? This is just a normal RAID 5 event because we have the data. Um, for the data missing, we have the parity. So we can reconstruct the data in the case of an entire appliance failure. So the, this architecture is all peer. It's a peered architecture. There are, there's no master node in this. In this example, all these five boxes are all peers of each other, so you have five active RAID controllers. The, all these boxes are operating in parallel, so it, this is actually showing our surveillance product where we have two gigabit uh, networks per box giving you a total of 10 gigabits. For our VDI box, we put 10 gigabit links in. So actually, in a five box array, you would have 100 gigabits of bandwidth available for the storage. The 
the, the drives for our VDI, what we have is in each box, we have 10 10K SAS drives plus two 100 gig SSDs. We created two tiers of storage so that we put hot files on the SSD and put the other files on spinning disk to try to balance out performance and cost. I mean, that's for VDI, it's a, it's a very high op environment, but it's also very cost sensitive. So you need to find a balance between, you know, you want just enough SSD in there so that you can get good performance, but still resort to the spinning disk for most of your storage. They, uh, with this architecture, there is no single point of failure. An entire box can fail. Any drive can fail. Any switch can fail. Any network cable can fail. I mean, anything you can put your finger on and touch and say, can that thing fail? The answer is yes, that can fail and you'll keep running. The, uh, when you create a logical volume, you get to pick the rate level you want for that logical volume. Um, you can pick different rate levels as you create different logical volumes. And, like any RAID system, you can trade off availability for capacity. So we have a range of RAID levels you can pick. The highest RAID level, you can withstand five simultaneous drive failures. I mean, that's five drives anywhere in the system. It's not like, oh, five just in this box, or let me pick in these five. It's no, you pick any five drives, they can fail and the system keeps running. Or you can suffer an entire appliance failure plus any two other drives anywhere else in the system. So, to be clear, you can't suffer five drive failures and an appliance failure, but it's either five drive failures anywhere or an appliance failure plus two drive failures anywhere else. Um, inside the box, I mean, the, a lot of your RAID controllers, I mean, the ones I used to build at Compact or whatever, we call, I call those Fort Knox boxes. You put a lot of expense and a lot of redundancy into that box because if the box ever dies, you're dead. We're kind of going the opposite way here. We're trying to use uh, uh, the high volume server technology, which does have, I mean, there's lots of single points of failure inside that one box over there. There's only one motherboard. There's one backplane. You know, there's one memory complex. So if that fails, that box is dead. Uh, but our, our software uh, raids these boxes together to make sure you can survive that failure. Um, you also get, uh, um, you can add boxes. Sorry. The scalability, how many boxes do you scale to? Um, Twelve. You, under our management, you can have uh, hundreds of boxes on the network, but in, we divide these up into arrays, what we call an array, which you would put a VMware cluster on each array. Each cluster is limited to 12 boxes. Okay. The number of boxes we support, uh, you can have a single box. We don't support two boxes, and then, but then from three to 12. And you can add boxes on the fly. So by your, if you start out with one box, you can then on the fly add two more boxes and keep growing. Sure. Is each box an ESX host? Yes, each box is an ESX host. We'll get into the architecture right next slide so you'll get the whole idea. Just before we do that, so let's ask uh, Chef Greg, where are you right now? What are sure. You, what are you I'm, uh, let's switch me over real quick. I'll show you yeah, what we've I done so far. Do this, right? um, after I finish this thought. Yeah. Right. You go ahead. So real quickly, if you've got a single box, is there anything different to make it more resilient, or is it just... No, if you have a box? single box, um, we do raid, I mean, in that case, we'll raid the drives inside the box to give you some drive fault tolerance, but no, I mean, you have a single point of failure if you have a single box. Okay, thank you. So now we're in parallel track here. Greg, where are you in the, in the recipe? Yeah, let me, uh, busy <coughs> typing. He's typing a oh, key. license. <laughs> um, let me go back to where I started. So the peak, so this is just a laptop, right? So the, we have the peak cube. I've connected to the two one gigabit connections on the back of it with the Apple Airport Extreme. Um, and then I'm connected wirelessly with vSphere, uh, vSphere client through, through that. And later on, I'll give you access to this wirelessly um, to, to let you access the, because I'll be serving up the uh, view connection server connection through there as well. So basically, what I've done so far is prepackaged on the PCube is uh, Active Directory. Uh, a management station, so that's where I'm running the uh, vSphere client, uh, vStack Manager, which is our management software. Um, 
whatever else, uh, uh, Internet Explorer that I'm using gets a view admin, of course. The, the Pivot 3 VM, that is our storage, uh, virtual storage appliance. And that, that's the secret sauce Bill's been talking about that allows us to span out in the iSCSI array. There's vCenter with View Composer installed and then the View Connection server. So all those are pre-installed. They're the, in each of them, ex, except for the Pivot 3 VM, they're all Server 2008 uh, installs. They're all licensed by us. We've, we provide embedded server licenses for those. All the, none of the view components, however, are installed, and I know Olivia is going to get into yeah. that later. But where I'm at, so I've brought all this up. I've connected with the remote desktop, uh, and now I'm in the in the process of installing the licenses to vCenter. So what what we're providing through uh, VMware's Assistant is 60-day View Premier 100 desktop licenses. The, we don't install those at the factory. It's a, because of where the uh, clock starts. The clock starts when they're installed. But the, the customer who, who purchases this from us receives those eval license and they, they get their pilot up in, in 60 minutes. That's where I'm at. So we, uh, thank you. So the, the other <laughs> concept is that we create an array of appliances, right? Which would then, we can, you can have a scale out storage across the array and you've got VMs in each of the appliances. Our first appliance that we ship can, can be optionally what we call a P-cubed appliance which comes as a fully configured appliance with view, DHCP, DNS, Active Directory, all configured, right out of the box, with trial licenses. And really what you're doing is you're entering your trial keys and then you're, you're, and then you're following essentially the recipe that you've got there. That's what we're doing right now. Is we're taking what would be essentially a first appliance that a customer would receive and how they would get going. We'll then go through and tell you how we scale out and all the things that go on beyond that. But that's what we're doing right now. It runs its own DNS and DHCP? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so on that Active Directory VM, it has uh, Active Directory, DNS, and ECP. Um, and I'll show you a better block diagram later on, but we have all that contained within the peak cube and, and not leaking out so that you can plug it to production environment without getting brand new DHCP addresses, for example. All right, so we've, we've, now we're going to sort of dive in and give you a little bit more on the, on the architecture. We talked a little bit about the... The, uh, the distributed parity, which is really the, some of the secret sauce, but here's how it looks architecturally so you get a sense of what's going on. And we'll build it out into multiple appliances. So, as someone was asking before, I mean, each box is an ESX host. Um, the, when it comes from us, there's one VM already installed. We have a small SSD that we install our VM on um, that we call VStack OS. We go around ESX and use Intel's VTD, or I guess uh, VMware calls it direct path, to go around ESX and we own all of the other storage devices in the box. ESX doesn't even know they exist. So we go around ESX using Intel VTD and we those 10 drives and the two SSDs that are in the box, we grab those and give those directly to our guest. So Every we, guest is doing drive path? No, only our guest. The, so our guest, so the, the only guest that, that you can find, when, when the box powers up, let me kind of describe the power up sequence, I think you'll see how it, it flows out. As the box powers up, the only guest that VMware can find is our guest because it's on, it's on a small 8 gig SSD that we install inside the box. It boots our guest. Our guest takes the drives and exports that back as iSCSI to ESX. So we control the boot sequence to ensure that we boot first. We then kick ESX to say, hey, go rescan for iSCSI devices. Then after it finds those, we say, you know, go uh, rescan your data stores looking for VMs, and then it winds up booting all of the other VMs. So we take the drives export those back as iSCSI to ESX, and then ESX hands out the data to all the other guests. I mean, the, the other guests don't talk to us at all. They just talk to ESX and get their data stores. <coughs> Can I ask when the whole thing is up and you've got like more than three or four nodes, do, do they automatically become part of a DRS and HA cluster? Yes. Yes. And you're using standard virtual switches, not distributed virtual switches? That is, yes. that is correct. Yes. The other, the other obvious advantage of using VTD is that we're, we're getting, you know, tremendous performance gains, right? We're not going through emulation layers to do that. So that's why we, 
this thing this thing really screams. In, in any virtualization environment, I mean, it, VMware's gotten really good at virtualizing the CPU. Um, I mean, the, the virtualization packs, <laughs> I call it, for you know, running in a virtual environment if you're a C, CPU-bound app is very low. But there is still a big overhead if you're doing I.O. And it turns out, I mean, that's all we're doing is I.O. So, I mean, there was about a 20 to 40 percent performance hit. If, if we had gone the more traditional route, let ESX own the disk, give those virtual disks to us, and then we re-export it as a virtualized SCSI volume, there's about a 20 to 40 percent performance hit for doing that. And if somebody wanted to go beyond the 12 limits that you have on the red side, would they just establish a new cluster? That, that is correct. Um, <coughs> But the thing when it comes out the box establishes a brand new, brand new virtual center AD environment. So how would they go about merging two of these systems together? The I'm not sure what you mean by merging two of these together. The, you in that case you would have two clusters. You would not you could not merge this into one cluster. You would have two clusters. When, when it starts up, there's just ESX. There's no virtual center, right? That's correct. All right, so you could just add it. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, as you add, go ahead and build it out to adding the multiple boxes. Um, so here's kind of the picture as you're adding multiple boxes. The, the VStack OS VMs are talking to each other. Uh, the, the ESX in any given box on, is only talking over a virtual network to its local VStack OS. There's a virtual private network uh, it goes through a vSwitch, but no physical network involved where ESX is mounting the iSCSI target that is residing in that guest. It doesn't talk to the, the vStack OSs in the other boxes. The local ESX in the second box talks to his local vStack OS over that private link and so on as you go as you add boxes. The vStack OSs are talking amongst themselves to present this what they look like ESX is a single iSCSI target. Even though there's multiple of them, they present themselves as a single iSCSI target that looks like it has multiple ports. Can I ask you, what would stop somebody taking your content and just duplicating it? What protects you from somebody else going, oh, that's a good idea, we could do that? Um, the, a shared, a, a, to do this in a peered architecture, I mean, people have done this before. I mean, in a previous life, I've done something like this before where you have a master node um, that manages everything underneath it. RAID is fairly easy to do when you have a master node. It, it sequences all the RAID operations. It handles all the failures. And then you have the storage underneath it. Th that, the problem with that is that doesn't scale performance-wise, and it becomes a fault tolerance issue. To do this as a peer architecture, and get the performance as a peer architecture. Um, it took us four years to write that code. Okay. And we have uh, quite a few patents already granted and some more in the pipe. So you see the main value in what you're doing is the kind of network RAID. Yeah. Yes. The fact that you've got this virtual center thing booting up and virtual desktops being created is just a, a kind of way of bundling it. It's, a, it's an application focus because we use the same we use the same operating system technology to on, do for surveillance. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, one of the characteristics of this. I mean, it's funny. We didn't really set out to do this when we did it. We set out to make this very very simple and easy to use. Now it turned out to do that. What we had done is we created virtualized storage. I mean, but when we were first designing this, we didn't think, oh, we're going out to go build virtualized storage. Mm. But we wanted to make sure it was very simple. Because, I mean, this is inherently very complex. Um, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts going on underneath as these boxes are talking to each other and managing the failures. But all of that is hidden. I mean, the, our user interface, our GUI, is very, very simple. You'll I mean, see it. All you do is say, hey, put these boxes together in an array. Hey, I want to create a volume. I want it to be this big. I want it to have this name and this RAID level. I mean. That's about all you do. And if you then you add another box, it dynamically load balances all, everything automatically. It's, it's hands free. It's simple. So, in fact, we have we have just a last point on that. We have, you know, most of the customers in the surveillance side, these are not IT guys, and for them to be running petabytes of storage 
and they're not sand administrators. They don't know anything about sand. Um, that's how simple it is. So, the, go ahead. Okay. Each, every time you add, like we add connections to run, so every time you add a box, you add all, you're also adding a connection server? No. no. So, the, the, I guess we've got to separate, there's two different things. There's the VStack OS itself, which really has nothing to do with Vue. So, I mean, what we've shown here is um, our base VDI box. Um, you put those together, it's a combined compute and storage environment. Tuned for, tune for desktops. Tuned for desktops. We have a second product offering where we take one of these boxes, we actually go ahead and create a single box array out of it in the factory and install all the view bits. That's what we call our P-Cube. I mean, that's what we took out of the box here. It's just a way for a customer to get up and going. I mean, this is, we're going to try to do it within the 60 minutes. So it's exactly the same VStack OS. There's no difference in that box. The storage and compute aspects are identical. It just comes preloaded with view. So when you take it out of the box, you can get up and going on the one box. And then what you would then add to the array is additional boxes that don't have the view bits loaded and it just expands out your array, you get more compute, you get more capacity, you get more network bandwidth. So you have to specify, you have to specify that if you're, a, if you're a customer, you have to order that? Out. That's right. You, you, yeah. order. you just decide whether, if you're, if you're a view customer and you've already got you know, a lot of view expertise and you've got your own, you know, you've got Active Directory running, you've got your, your, you've got your management server for vCenter, you might just buy the VDI boxes and say, fine, I can, I can just go and, and, and deploy my desktops. But if you're like a lot of the folks we're targeting the SMB space where they're going, Shoot, I want to get a I want to get a, a, a pilot going, out of the box in you know in 60 minutes and get going. It comes completely loaded, the management server, everything there. And if you choose it, and you'll see at the end, if you choose to continue to use it, you could continue to use it on the same array, or you could migrate those settings over to your management server wherever you, you know whatever you want uh, elsewhere. Is each box shows up as a compute node in Virtual Sam? Yes. Yes. I mean each each, each box is an ex. ex so how you get a cluster of 12 when 8's only eight's the maximum in For VDI, yes, it's, it's 8. I mean, the, our limit, uh, we do this in things other than VDI, so I'm sorry for the confusion there. Our limit is 12. If you are using this for VDI, then the limit is 8 currently. So, two questions. It looks like VStack OS is effectively a replicating vir uh, virtual storage device. It's not replication. It's not replication, but well, it, doing something like some sort of RAID using the VSTAC yes. OS. Yes, yes that so is correct. cross device RAID. Yes. yes. And you also mentioned using Intel VTD. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. For storage, so you're not using VM Direct Path, you're using SCSI Direct Path or something like that. No, we are using VM Direct Path. So you're doing networking. Well, I'm sorry. We're using VM Direct Path for, I mean, when you just say VM Direct Path, that really doesn't. It means just networking. Well, that means give a PCI device to a guest. Well, it means give an SR, uh, SR single root IO virtualization device to a guest. No, you can also give any PCI device to a guest. Okay. Yes. So we're giving the, the host adapter that's in this box to a guest. To a guest. The, mm. It's a SAS. I mean, it's a, in this particular case, it's a a dumb host adapter, Dell would call it an H200 RAID controller, but it's configured in a non-RAID fashion. Can you do, is it any? It's not any, as far as I know, it's not any device. It's not any device. So it has um, to be a single root IOV supported device. No, it doesn't have to be SRIOV, but there is a list of devices that they will allow you to export. Okay. And this is one of them. Okay, so it's a limited subset. Yes. Okay. It has to support Intel VTD yes. itself. All right. What are the specs on one of your nodes? We're going to get right now. Here we go. It's funny you should mention that. So, as I said before, this is just a Dell R510 server. <coughs> and there's but it's a very nice Dell. <laughs> has a cool logo on the front. Yeah, very cool logo. Yeah. So what are you looking to put, you know, average desktop per node? 115 is what we've been benchmarked with our reference architecture with VMware. Per node. That's yeah. a medium user then? Like two CPU, two gig, or? Um, the task yeah. user, one, is, one CPU, one gig. Right. <coughs> so here, I mean, this is a specially, I mean, 
there is a very particular configuration of this Dell R510. I mean, we sell this as an appliance. Um, so when that appliance comes, um, it, we have two 10 gig Ethernet ports. Um, there are two t uh, one gig ports in it as well, which you can use for your management networks, or you can even use those for the desktops as you want. Um, we create a VLAN on the two 10 gig ports for all the storage traffic so that all the boxes that are talking to each other, uh, we create two VLANs, one on each of the 10 gig ports. So all the storage traffic that goes on on those two 10 gig links is contained to that VLAN. Um, vSphere, so ESX 5.0 is already loaded on there. And that is the one VMware license where that is already licensed from us. I mean, just even build this in the factory, that has to be licensed. So the ESXi hypervisor, even though it's technically the free one um, to get the, the support from VMware for OEM to install it, you have to license that. So that is licensed. Um, some of the common failure items are hot swappable, the power supplies, the, the hard drives, I mean, they're all hot swappable. It's got two hex core processors in it. Um, we put 96 gig of RAM. Then for the storage in it, what we have is our 10 300 gigabyte 10K SAS drives and two 100 gig SSDs. Now those SSDs serve two different functions in there. We carve off 25 gig out of each one and we make a write cache out of that. So even if you are writing to the spinning disk, the data is going to get written to that 25 gig area of the SSDs. The host will be told, yes, your write is done, and it is stored in a non it is stored non volatile So yes, even if you lost power, then that write is protected. Um, the other 150 gig on each SSD is available as a second tier of storage. So what we do is we present two iSCSI targets to ESX. One that contains a spinning disk and one that contains the, the collection of all the SSDs and all the boxes. So in that case, so for view, what we do is we take your replica images. I mean, those see a lot of read traffic. I mean, those is a, is a limited amount of storage, but it's going to see very high IOPS. So we just put those on the SSD. All the link clones, they go on the spinning disk. So now this is SAN storage. I mean, it, so it it's, can get a little bit confusing. This is SAN storage, so even though a box fails, I mean, you're not writing to the disk that are in your box. I mean, some small fraction of the time you are. You're writing to all the disk and all the boxes, so when a box fails, um, and HA kicks in, that desktop moves to another box, and all the data is still there because it was RAID protected. Is it an installed on the hard drives or on the image it, It's installed on that uh, 16, but in, it's actually a 16 gig SSD, 8 gig is for the ESX install, and 8 gig is for our Pivot 3 vStack OS. So. Have you seen a performance difference between the HS200, HS700, and any of the other ones that are in the The HS700 wants, I mean, it thinks of itself as a RAID controller and wants to manage RAID on those drives, but see, our RAID crosses boxes, which the H700 doesn't know how to do. So um, we could use an H700, but we have to turn off all the RAID, and you turn off all the features on it, so now you're just paying a lot for Q depth and a lot more. Uh, no, actually, the, the Q depth, um, the way we have configured the H200, the Q depth is controlled by the drives, not um, not the controller itself. So we, we just want a dumb host adapter. All the RAID is managed by our software because that's the only way you can get the RAID algorithms to cross box boundaries. Can I just double back to something you said earlier? The, the testing that you said that you had 100 VMs on one box, and the specification of each of those virtual desks was one CPU and one gig of RAM, is that right? What, what guest operating system were you running inside the, the VM in those tests? Is it Windows XP? Go ahead. We're uh, using Windows 7. 
one gig of RAM and one for PCP. Yeah, the 32 bit Windows 7, which is meets Microsoft's uh, recommendations for view Windows 7 in a virtual environment. And those tests, do they include <coughs> the kind of tests you can do where you actually spin up applications inside the VM? And yeah, yeah, we got a, yeah, we we have a slide have a on that later. We have a section on the test we'll results. About that. And, yep. So, from an architecture standpoint, what was, what was the driving force behind going with two SSD drives instead of like a flash card like Fusion AM? Um, Cost. Price. I mean, that Fusion I.O. card is extremely expensive. Now, it performs great. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, not knocking the Fusion I.O. card. I mean, it has very good performance. But um, the, the performance you get versus the cost just didn't, didn't add up when we did the math on it. So when a customer orders this... Uh box, right? Mm -hmm. And they want to upgrade to a three-node environment. Yep. Since you've since you've built their AD and all, yep. um, do you do that again for the? No, the the other boxes you have that you add is just the standard VDI box, which doesn't have any of those extra view bits already installed. So it just expands the size of the data stores grow and the number of hosts in your cluster grew. Right. As far as view is concerned, I mean. AD, none of that stuff changed as you added the second and third and fourth box. Actually, we'll, we'll also do, a, we're going to also do a demo, two demos today. We're going to do one back to our hosted array in Houston, and you'll see it, where, where we're going to join is the 301st or whatever desktop in, a, in an environment which is actually running rock in the background, so it's running simulated workloads. And that's called test drive, and if you go and sign up for a test drive, you can actually yourself increase the array size by one and see how it does it completely dynamically. So it's pretty cool. So it's... Now, if you already have the existing, you don't need to use. No, There's no, you don't need. No. To. We're, we'll show you a scenario after where somebody would say, "I'm going to." Greg's got a slide on that, which will show you how you can take it from from one unit to production, and if you've got your own environment, how you connect it up. That makes sense. Can I customer move the wallet to just use their own hardware, just purchase the the software from you in, in that configuration? We currently don't sell it as software. We sell it as an appliance. Well, you need to specialize. Yeah, uh, RAID controls. If you have right. one that's not supported, this one won't work. Right. <laughs> okay, so that, that Dell box has the specialized RAID controls. Well, it has an H200 well, I mean, in it, but. It's not specialized. No, it's not specialized. Well, it actually is not. I mean, the way it's configured is specialized, but. It, yeah. That's the match that can fake yes. those products. That's right. That's the support VTD. The, the tar yeah. target market is SMB, though, right? So yes. They don't want to build. It's not going after the enterprise. No, no, we, we, that's the whole point. Yeah. I mean, the idea right now, and so that also answers the other question about why, why not Fusion IO. We start at 100, and our target's from 100 to 1,000 desktops. We can scale beyond that, but what we're, what we're doing is delivering, delivering a real compelling price point to the customer. You know, right now we're at $350, and we think that by, by the summer we'll be at $250 for the infrastructure per desktop. That's pretty darn good. I mean, when you compare, when you start getting into those price points, you're now very compelling. So... That's the target that we're. What's that? No, no, not including the endpoint. That would be just for the compute and storage. Right. <coughs> All right. So we'll we'll, we'll, we'll we'll get to that. You'll, sorry, I, I jumped ahead here, but I wanted to make. I wanted to. <laughs> I did want to make sure that your, your your point was absolutely right on the money. That's where we're targeting. It's really the SMB. For us, at, we're a converged um, unified storage and compute appliance, as you know. As we move up, as you get closer to the data center, where folks are running six, 7,000 desktops, I mean, there's no doubt that this could scale to that, but you'd be running a lot of boxes, which would be, you know, maybe not as desirable. But the issue that you get is you, you get siloed data centers, where you get the SAN administrator, you get the network administrator, and everybody wants to disaggregate the solution, right? Because they've got their own specific religious feelings about specific SAN or specific network or specific CPU requirements. In the SMB space, you're talking about a person who doesn't have that Who's, who's actually converged themselves. Essentially, they've got a converged environment, it's them. And so getting the right price point, getting something that's consumable, simple, deliverable to the, to the market was the idea. That also answers why we don't deliver it as software. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, disaggregate the Mac. Let's, send, let's ship OS X. That's, that was never going to be in Steve Jobs' head. He felt as long as he controlled the hardware, he'd be able to deliver the user, control the user experience. And it's a little bit of that. How come it doesn't have the word private cloud slapped all over it? You know, and, oh, it's private cloud, <laughs> private cloud. Sorry. You haven't said cloud in the last Sorry. Cloud. Yeah. <laughs> Are we missing a theme of this week? <laughs> <laughs> Other vendors, if they had this, they'd be 
the product cloud stack and um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not as hip on the marketing side. I'm, I'm much more realistic in trying to get people who want to do real things for a living. Oh, snap. Yeah. <laughs> 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 sold it. We're going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys. I just did. It's just the gray hair, man. It's like, anyway, all right. There, there was a question on Twitter. Where is the ESXi installed? SD card or on the SSD? The, the, so there is a 8 gig, I mean the 16 gig, uh, SSD that is actually installed on the the onboard SATA, the onboard motherboard SATA controller. So it's the disk on module tech. That yes. It's yes. A USB flash drive. That is correct. correct. Okay. It's based on SLC technology. It's not the you know the cheaper MLC. So that I would say we call a SATA DOM, eight gig. I mean a sixteen gig SLC SATA DOM that has ESX and it has the VStack OS installed on it. So that's really the only storage ESX natively knows about. All right. Um, other highlights, I mean, we're going to go through this very quickly, but this just gives you a sense of the depth. The thing that we're bringing is enterprise class features into a very simple SMB consumable environment, which is really kind of cool. I mean, if you think about it, it's hard to do. Uh, a lot of this I've already talked, yeah, so I'll just kind of go real quick. I mean, some of the things we haven't talked about is, I mean, there's other features in there like rather than a spare drive per box, I mean, it's a global virtual hot spare across the entire array. There's two benefits to that. One, you don't take up the space of a spare drive per box. I mean, it's just a, a small slice of every drive is your spare. And the second benefit is when you do have to spare it out, you're actually re you're reading from all the drives and you're writing to all the drives, so you can spare it out much quicker. Um, and one other thing we do is we're constantly scanning the drives in the background, um, you know, making sure all the data is readable. And if we see drive if we see a drive that um, what happens a lot of times these drives the drives don't completely fail, but they're very very sick. They're the 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 I O the <laughs> 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 and what can happen is if that if that drive is is very slow to respond to I/O, it takes it can bring your whole system down. So we detect those drives, and what we do, we will actually uh, start sparing that drive out. We don't fail it right away. We quit steer. I mean, any I/O that we can optionally steer away from that drive, we will immediately steer it away from that drive and we will start sparing that drive immediately. We don't quite fail it yet, just in case you have some other failure somewhere else in the system. We didn't want to take you down one level of your fault tolerance, but we're rebuilding that drive, we're, we're sparing it out before it fails, and as soon as we finish sparing it, we then fail that drive to get you back up to optimal performance. And yes, you do get warnings that we're sparing the drive. <laughs> yeah, yes? Good question. If you're if for some reason the, the VStack appliance fails, um, do you force the compute side down, or does that host get to stay alive using the other storage? The host does get to stay alive. Um, we have, uh, there's a small piece of code we installed on ESX, I mean, like a VIB, and with its multi-pathing, what it does is it reconfigures, it set up alternate paths so that that host could talk to all the other boxes, but then it sets the local link as the only link for it, you to use as long as it's alive. <coughs> so if that vStack OS were to die, the host can stay alive and you can still use its compute and memory resources. That's fantastic. Question? Yes? Do you do any type of hardware snapshot in the model? Or is it no, we do not. Yes. I just got a... Sorry, I just got a note from the chef. He's actually done configuring the environment, so it's, it's ready, just FYI, and we were roughly about 40, 40 minutes, so pretty good. We'll get to that. We'll get to the demo in a sec. All right. Uh, they can go on to it. Well, this is another one, too. Desktops can be moved yeah. or added, right? Yeah, I mean, the, just as a for instance, as opposed to something like a Newtonic where, I mean, they're always trying to move the the data where the VMs are. So as VMs were to move around, they're going to try to have the data follow the VM to get the performance that they need. In our case, 
we're, you're spread out over all the drives and all the boxes all the time anyway, and we manage to get good performance out of that. So as VMs move, I mean, your data doesn't move. Your data stays exactly where it was the whole time. So in a two-node failure, you lose everything? Yes, you would lose everything. Okay. So what happens in the power of it? Well, <laughs> you know, that's, that, that's not exactly true. It all becomes un unavailable, and you, you're allowed to then fix the second one you fail. But you lost all the data still on the drive, and, and then you can recover your array. You can recover from two node failures? Well, it depends on what fails. It depends on what fails. If there's data in a period. Exactly. So if you're, if what you're, happens on the, when the second one fails, the array just shuts itself down. Okay. Now, if it's possible to repair, what failed in that second box, say its CPU died, and you repair yeah, the yeah, CPU. I mean, obviously we're talking disk. Right? Then you, but if, if all the disk in one box failed, and then all the disk in another box failed, you're dead. Yeah, like, like it blew up in a fire or something. Yes. <laughs> you're, uh, then you Tannik's comment, I would, I would say to, like, you're the SMB play, but I would say they, have, they offer higher densities. Yes. I mean, fair, the, fair. I mean, I think with Nutanix, I mean, I, the way I think of them is, I guess, two things. One, they're a more general purpose uh, conversion architecture. In our case, we chose to deliver it on a box specifically tuned for VDI. And I think where we're aiming in the VDI market is lower than where they're aiming. I mean, I think at the higher numbers of desktops, they would be just fine. I mean, I think they cost more, but they're aiming at a, at a higher point than where we're aiming. Yeah, you're, you're offering yeah. All right. Storage aggregation. I think we've, we've done that dynamic expansion. Yeah. So you add an appliance, everything gets dynamically load balanced automatically, right? You don't have to, so it just gets, all the data gets restriped, distributed parity happens. Everything We're doing it in the background. We limit this, I mean, we purposely make, I mean, when you add an extra box, we are moving all the data around. I mean, you can think of it like the, the water is kind of flowing to the, to the lowest point. So there is a lot of data that moves. We do it in the background at a very low priority. So, I mean, it may take us a day to add that box and, and rebalance everything because we don't want to hurt your foreground performance while we're doing that. A little bit on uh, replication. Yeah I, mean, yeah, I mean, I guess another thing, I mean, there's other people that have done some things similar to this, but almost all of them are based on replication where, yeah, I'm going to mirror the data in another box. Um, that is obviously much simpler than trying to do RAID and read Solomon algorithms across multiple boxes, <coughs> but it really costs you in usable capacity. Because if you're going to mirror the data, I mean, right off the bat, you're at 50% usable capacity. And then there's times where people mirror it inside the box, then mirror it across boxes. I mean, so you can get down to 25% capacity. With RAID 5, I mean, you can be as high as 90% usable capacity, and you can actually withstand more failures. I mean, if you're replicating, you lose the wrong two drives and you're dead. So, so in the BDI space, I mean, IAPS is, is so targeted, you know, as far as yeah. performance and, and sizing. What kind of IAPS are you able to push per node? The, for this particular node, I mean, the, we really haven't run it through a suite of your standard IAP test. What we've been focused on is how many desktops it supports. Because, I mean, that's kind of the only workload that this is geared for. And so to run a synthetic benchmark where say, hey, I'm going to do 4K random reads and certain percentage of writes doesn't really match up. And when you have two tiers of storage, I mean, you're going to get uh, fantastic IOPS on the SSD tier, not as good IOPS on the, the spinning disk tier. Yeah, I understand that, you know, the replica would be sitting on your SSDs most that's likely. And that's right. The link clones on the status. Right. I'm just curious, what, what kind of I.O. can you get on the status? Those link clones saturate with, with data? The, well, I mean, the, we've done all our testing with ROC for that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Greg has the test results to show you on ROC that, hey, here's the desktops we were running. Here's the load those desktops were doing. I mean, those desktops were busy doing stuff the entire time. And then here's the, you know, all the times for, here's how long it took to load a document. And we've got all those times. So you're not concerned at all with, with the IOPS for putting, that, you know, any kind of workload on there? Uh, it's targeted more like task-based worker, where it's a floating pool, you're throwing it away? Or? Uh, yes, it is more targeted toward tasks. Okay. Um, you could run a limited number of non-task users, but I, mean, I think given the capacity that's in the box, mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, if you tried to run, you know, a hundred of, you know, non-task users, yeah, you would run out of gas. Could you, or will you have support for the Apex cards? Will you include that in? Um, we have talked to them, um, and we could. I mean, that it's, it's another one of those things of trading off performance and cost. Okay. Um, it would be easy for us to plug those in. Um, as soon as we're convinced that it is, is it value? that you get the value for it, we're, we will plug them in. So uh, why not erase your coding instead of parity? Um, it actually is, I mean, it, it, it's a little bit hard to describe because there's RAID levels that go across the boxes and then the, the RAID inside the boxes, it's entangled with that. And we do have erasure coding in there as well. I mean, it, you can think of it across the boxes as parity, but there's also an erasure code that goes in there as well. Right, but I mean, you, you, gave, you listed all the advantages of using RAID, but you obviously haven't listed any of the disadvantages, right? Um, and it's just interesting, both you and Nutanix going after similar kind of stuff, right. different parts of the market. You both chose to use uh, traditional RAID. I mean, albeit you've enhanced it. It's, mm -hmm. But you still, I, I would guess that that means that when you have that single node failure that you illustrated early on in the slides, you then suffer from all the crap that you suffer when you have a drive or node failure, which means decreased performance, Yes. all of that stuff. Um, and then even more decreased performance while you're doing a rebuild to replace that node. Yeah, so that so, is true. So there are other alternative storage systems that are coming out these days that are not using RAID, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so just wondering why not choose one of those types of ways to do uh, distributed protection across disk instead of just using RAID. Um, well, I guess the, all the erasure codes I'm familiar with suffer those same, I mean, no. well, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's the way that people like to talk about it where you're reading all the data all the time mm -hmm. so that you don't suffer a performance penalty when you do fail those drives. I mean, so I'm familiar with those, but if you're reading all the drives all the time, that <clears throat> decreases your parallelism. So at least every way I've looked at it, it lowers the, the overall performance. Now, the performance doesn't change in the face of a failure, but you started from a lower point. Because if you're reading from all the drives all the time, and then doing math to say, yeah, the ratio right. code, this one fell out. But yeah. because it's not RAID, that could be 57 drives instead of... True, but, right. but, but reading from all the drives all the time um, limits your parallelism and limits the, perf the, the random, they're gr that is great for sequential. I mean, and people in the video world do that all the time where they're doing video streaming or video capture or editing movies where, you know, they have very, very high performance requirements. Mm -hmm. The data is very, very sequential and they understand, hey, I'm just going to read all the drives all the time and it's a zero performance hit if, you know, any number of these drives drops out. Um, and that type of workload, yes, I, I see how that could work. A VDI workload is very, very random. Those type of environments where you read from all the disk all the time don't lend themselves to random workloads. I'll just have to take your word on that, but um, uh, just braids just getting a little long in the tooth, you know? And to see a brand new product designed based on RAID, just that's all. That's all I'm saying. I think, I mean, we have done a lot of work to make sure that the performance when you are degraded, I mean, it goes down. It has to. Um, but it goes down by a very small amount. And then we are very precisely controlling the rate at which we're rebuilding and bringing the new box in. I mean, if you just went flat out, you would tank your foreground performance. So we're very precisely controlling the rate at which we're doing that, monitoring the foreground activity. I mean, we'll be uh, aggressive if we can. If we find you're not pressing the foreground very hard, we'll do the background a whole lot faster. But we make sure to preserve your foreground performance while we're doing that rebuild. 
Okay. Uh, uh, I think we can. Yeah, I think we. Take we most of these. These are the additional kind of enterprise storage features that are part of the, the solution. Uh, a lot of folks have talked about this, or have been asking about specifically uh, architecture and product test results. I'm going to let Greg, I'll, I'll just go through um, and hit for you. Okay, sounds good. Um, the, so we've, let me slide over here where Bill was dancing. I mean standing. Um, <coughs> so we've done a lot of testing. Um, like we're, everybody said, these are purpose-built appliances specific to VDI. We've done a lot of testing along with that. Um, have some results here for the reference architecture testing that we conducted with the VMware View reference architecture team. Um, there's testing that talk, I'll talk about here a little bit. The rapid desktop t uh, team in VMware, their, their charter is kind of to figure out how to have multiple products coming out that deliver 100 desktops at a time for a, a, a pilot purpose. So kind of taking on the, the challenge of how do you bring up something in 40 minutes, 60 minutes to, you know, the 100 desktops. Um, and so we are certified as part of the rapid desktop program. The testing on that was done with AP cubed, 100 desktops on it, doing workloads that are standard Microsoft Office uh, kind of workloads. So um, on the VMware compatibility guide for view pilots, we're... Um, we're on part of a very short list. Um, so the, the reference architecture, we, we focused on four items. We focus on load balance and for performance. So in a scale out array of say three unit, three appliance, V stack VDI appliances, 115, de well 100, up to 115 desktops per, talk about 230 here because what I was looking at is take, being able to, when a, an appliance fails, get 115 on each of the two remaining. So using DR, uh, HA, they fell over those desktops there. You have 100% availability. So we're looking at performance characteristics that way. Uh, ability to self-heal, that's when a, an appliance fails, of course, bringing it back online. The storage stayed online the whole time. Um, since we're collapsed storage and compute, there is a piece there where, so a unit fails, those desktops that we're running on it reboot on the, the other units in the array and uh, cluster, and then when we heal that back, where we, you know, bring in a new healthy unit, replace that, and both in terms of the storage array and also in terms of the the view pool v, uh, VMware cl HA cluster, then the, then the desktops migrate back over to it. Um, dynamic scaling, proven that as we as we add units to the array, that we we get a, a linear scaling where each desktop uh, for this particular workload each box that we added, each VSAT VDI that we added array, we could add another 115 desktops and maintain the throughput. Um, and then vMotion is a port, of course, because everything we're doing with failure and scaling and everything required reallocating of resources across the store array. How do, you, how do you control the vMotion if you're using these standard switches? How do we, I'm oh, sorry? How do you control the bandwidth that vMotion is taking up if you're using these standard switches? Um, we, we're using, so the VSAT VDI has a pair of one gigabit NICs and also a pair of 10 gigabit NICs for the storage. Putting the vMotion across the 10 gig networks is, you know, not, not terribly taxing. We also did another set of test results recently at ESG, do a complete benchmark, and the next couple of slides are some of the, some of the questions you guys ask in terms of uh, scale out of performance and then obviously the uh, also in degraded mode performance, how did it, how did it, how did it fare? Right, and there, this, so this is the ESG test report. Um, one of the things that the, the, the way we did the testing is we started with a single P-cube of 100 desktops, tested there, grew that into a three unit array and, and added desktops to it. Um, and then grew that all the way up to the, the maximum of a view pool which would be eight VSAT VDIs, uh, again, stay, growing the, the desktop so we have 100, 100 per box. And, you know, you, you look at the latencies, they're, they're well within acceptable uh, performance. Uh, then if we look at part, part of this testing and these questions have been asked is, well, what about failures? What happens when we fail? Um, we pull in a drive, since we're 
not reading all the devices all at once, but, but they're all available. And depending where the random I.O. goes with, with this many desktops, we're pretty close to accessing all the drives very, very frequently. Pulling a drive uh, really resulted in, in, in no noticeable latency to, a de to the desktop users. Uh, dropping power to a box. And we did this, by the way, after we pulled the drive, then I disconnected power, then we, ESG disconnected power and lost that as well. What we saw in our test tools, we were using this uh, reference architecture workload generator, which uses micro, a suite of Microsoft tools, Office, Excel, Word, um, and, and Adobe Acrobat Reader, things like that, and then it gen generates workload during that. So we were running all of those. It, and, and the way it runs is it connects with the view client um, have it from many different uh, session launchers. So when, when we lost a box, the, the way this tool works, it didn't reconnect to the desktops after they failed over, after they restarted in other boxes. So those desktop workloads were kind of gone. But all the ones that were still there were con continuing to run. And indeed, we, we did connect to the desktops after they failed over. And, and they were, we worked exactly like you would expect after a Windows 7 uh, desktop reboot. So the test result, the summary from ESG Labs was very complimentary. Um, enterprise class, reliability, availability, and data management. Um, rapid implementation of, you know, again, it started at 100 desktops, scaling up rapidly to 300, and then, and then getting on up to 800 was very seamless, very simple with our storage tools. Um, ran through the different component failures, and of course, all the all the VMware DRS HA functionality just works since we're collapsed the compute onto the SAN infrastructure. All right, time for demos.